OK. All right, well, thanks so much to everybody in the room who came out and everybody who's online virtually. I really appreciate your time and being here. So I am from NASA, and, um, but my background is actually as a field scientist. And so I've been going out to really interesting, kind of weird places around the world, uh, basically since I was a kid, since I was, since I was about 17 years old. And then luckily, you know, for me, managed to kind of dovetail that into like a real adult job, so to speak. Um, but I still get to go out into some really interesting places that I'm going to be talking to you about today. I primarily work underwater, but I also have, uh, you know, now kind of expanded my horizons. I work in deserts. I work in uh, cold polar region, regions on the surface as well. Um, and we sort of at NASA have used this opportunity where we are out in these field environments doing research as a mechanism by which to learn um, how to do science in extreme environments. And the idea is to take the learning that we gather from these environments and export them in terms of how we set ourselves up to, for success scientifically, and also in terms of protecting the people that are out there for when we actually you know, go off Earth into places like the moon, um, to asteroids, and to Mars. So that's going to be um, sort of the focus of my talk today. Um, and one of the main things that we contend with when we move beyond the Earth are time delays. So you know, um, I remember using, you know, I just, I, whenever I used to call my grandma, or even when my uh, boyfriend, who became my husband, he went to Japan and you know, taught English in 19... 95 or something like that. And uh, you know, speaking to him on the phone, there was always that hiccup, that kind of time delay. So irritating. And that's just having a regular conversation. When you start to inject in a known time delay moving from, let's say, lunar circumstances, where you have a, a second delay um, one way, which is you know, two plus seconds return. Or if you're moving to an asteroid where it's 50 seconds one way delay, and then outwards to Mars, where you know, it could be 10, 15, 20 minutes, it, it gets problematic, especially if you have humans at the other end uh, who need to respond to you know, others that are sitting on Earth and dealing with um, information and trying to get information back. So what we do out in the field is basically what I'm going to talk to you about today in terms of learning um, how to contend with those issues when you have lots of scientists who are very demanding, uh, you know, real engineering issues, and people at the other end who have to stay alive, and how do we deal with all that when we're in the field. Um, let me expand this so we can see the big slides. Um, so as I mentioned very quickly in my intro, the three places that have come up, which depending on the flavor of the month, we are or are not allowed to speak about in terms of a destination. Um, but you know, you will hear in the corridors, uh, it tends to be the moon, Mars, the moons of Mars even, or an asteroid. These are all the long-term human exploration targets that we're interested in. There are various reasons why we might want to go to each of these different targets. The moon is, you know, close by, so to speak. It is somewhere that we can get to within a reasonable amount of time and come back if there's some safety issues. Asteroids have been a number of reasons that are listed, whether it's from the planetary sciences to maybe economic reasons that we may want to go to an asteroid. Um, one mission that you may or may not have heard about is called the Asteroid Retrieval Mission, or ARM, uh, which is actually capturing a near-Earth asteroid um, and bringing that back into uh, nearby to the moon in one of what's called the Lagrange points. Um, and then Mars. Mars has always been um, on our kind of, um, I guess, vision path. And you know, even outside of NASA, I mean, you may have read lots of different books and you know, thought about it yourself as, in terms of an interesting destination to go, whether or not it's just to get there or for the science, maybe a very interesting place to um, investigate for signs of past life or present day life within our solar system. So those are some of the, the regions that we want to get to. But in all cases, and I can actually click, I think. In all cases, we are going to be dealing, as I mentioned, with varying degrees um, of, of latencies, of communication latencies, whether it's um, ranging from um, you know, a lunar surface of, as I mentioned, 1.2 seconds uh, is the closest kind of one-way light time delay that you would experience, all the way to if you were operating, say, on the moons of Mars, where you get up to 186 seconds, or at an asteroid, where it's 50-second one-way um, delay. So you multiply that by two, and you've got difficulties. And you know, times two, that is just the bare minimum of what you're dealing with in terms of the, the delay that um, one would have in making a decision that's a group team decision between those that are out in the field and those that are um, uh, actually sitting back home you know, ensconced in the safety of Earth. So what we're doing um, within our field programs, and I'm going to show you um, in, a, in a couple of slides, is actually focusing on um, understanding the operational concepts that we need to support humans and robots working in tandem or working in you know, sort of a phased way 
out in extreme environments. And so there's a couple of terms that I'll keep coming up that I wanted to define early on in the talk. One of them is concepts of operations or CONOPS, uh, which are defined as these operational design elements, how you organize people, how you actually flow them through different pathways when you are doing different tasks, as well as the term capabilities. So this can be defined as anything, um, you know, a functional aspect of a mission ranging from hardware to software. So we will look at what are the capabilities that are required to support humans and robots working in these extreme environments, as well as what are the concepts of operations, the con-ops that are needed as well. So there are a variety of different, uh, what are called analogs within the NASA family. They do different things, they serve different purposes. Um, and uh, some of them um, have really nifty uh, acronyms, such as NEMO, as Chris mentioned. Um, but they all kind of join up to one big um, you know, loop of, of transfer of knowledge. So NEMO is actually um, conducted, this is, these are some images from the NEMO test site, out in the Florida Keys. Um, and this test, or this analog, makes use of the Aquarius base. I don't know if you guys have heard about this. Um, Aquarius is actually a submerged base. It's about 60 feet underwater, um, and it's out in the Florida Keys, as I mentioned. And people have used this over the years um, to uh, basically learn about these aquatic, uh, the marine aqu environment um, by actually being you know, ensconced in it through the night, and so day and night, and they will actually live in there for like seven, 14 days at a time. So everyone from um, you know, offspring of Jacques Cousteau to James Cameron to like real scientists and so forth have used this environment over time. And so NASA uses it as well um, in order to send out their aquanauts into this um, microgravity environment so that they can learn about um, different sort of uh, hardware support elements that one would need when you're out operating on, say, the moon or an asteroid. So um, that is one really interesting analog that have been, you know, I've had the pleasure of being involved with. Um, and then another is actually this thing called Desert Rats. So this is based in, um, in and around the Flagstaff region in Arizona. And they, the intent here is to actually um, sort of use these larger hardware uh, that are being built, things like this. It's called a space exploration vehicle. It's an analog to a pressurized vehicle that we may want to drive around on the surface of the moon or Mars or actually use as a free flyer into an asteroid. It will keep your astro uh, astronauts nice and safe and cozy within um, this pressurized environment. And you can drive around for quite a distance and then actually have people exit that vehicle and go on what's called extravehicular activities or EVAs. Um, so these two test environments are actually used as field tests for the engineers. Um, and they also do, at the Johnson Space Center, a lot of lab experiments, simulations, um, whether that's, uh, you know, I'll show you a couple pictures in a moment, um, tying people up and actually, you know, having them on a tether and mimicking, once again, this microgravity environment and trying to use different tools to, say, sample an asteroid. So all of these are very engineering focused. And where we come in with the Pavilion Lake Re Research Project, which is the topic or the, the project that I'm going to be spending the most time on today, is that we offer a basis of real science. And so what that does is you know, there are different um, uh, tests that go on at these three um, uh, field sites that lead to learning um, in terms of what are the best con ops and capabilities that, they, that the engineers have identified to support different EVA capabilities. And then they come to us and they say, OK, so what happens if we're doing science? Do these you know, learnings actually still hold? Are they still you know, worth what we think they're worth? And so we will go underwater into Pavilion Lake and conduct our science and actually absorb their learning and test it there. So that's this kind of um, nice little family of NASA analogs that uh, you know, are, are still in operation and working together. So some of the um, concepts that are being tested at NEMO, at Desert Rats uh, previously, as well as in the lab, are, for example, this is an asteroid mission where you have um, an asteroid that's actually, you know, uh, uh, pardon me, anchored into um, the asteroid itself, working along a grid and examining it and figuring out which samples to collect. Um, another uh, possible scenario for going to an asteroid is where you have this pressurized vehicle with an arm at the end, um, and uh, this arm is actually supporting an, ast an astronaut, and then free flying the astronaut into a specific site of interest, and then having them kind of examine it based on that. So they will go through um, in these Nemo and, and uh, Desert Rats environments and test these different scenarios. You know, they 
have like seven, ten different conditions that they'll look at at any one point in time um, that deal with everything from you know one person at a base uh, that's kind of orbiting um, or you know nearby to an asteroid, and then two people going out on EVA to, for example, two. Um, SEVs coming in, free flyers, and actually um, supporting the, the EVA that way. So what's used are metrics. This is a bit of an eyesore, I apologize. These are slides that have been absorbed from my NASA presentations where we love tiny, tiny text. Um, so <laughs> it's like if you squint, you can see it. Apparently, it's not valid unless it's tiny and prolific in terms of text. Um, but anyways, we will look at everything from the simulation itself and what kind of quality of simulation did we actually um, conduct. So, for example, if we're conducting a simulation and um, let's say you know the network is down, well, that's a poor simulation. I mean, we didn't simulate anything because everything was broken. So that's a very um, simple anecdote. But those are the types of things that we'll make sure that we score before we move on to the other um, ratings that we collect. We look at the acceptability um, of the simulation as well as the capabilities themselves, and we assess those. Um, and with and as we use those uh, metrics. We'll actually um, use them during um, in very set moments in time during our simulations themselves. So we move from the lab, as I mentioned, out into the field. Um, you see here there's actually the free flyer testing one of those conditions. Um, and of course, this free flyer is rover roving uh, with wheels on the surface of the desert and connected to an astro astronaut right here who's working under different types of time constraints. So they may only have 20 minutes to be out there or two hours to be out there, depending on the condition that they're testing. Um, these are some more images, once again, taking the lessons that are learned from desert rats, where one great thing about that environment is that, um, of course, if anything goes wrong, they're above, they're on the land, uh, you know, you can breathe the air, there's nothing dangerous about it. But they will take that, um, the lessons from desert rats and test it underwater, where you are dealing with some real intrinsic dangers. Um, and so the kind of fidelity or the realness of this simulation increases just that much more and is that much more similar to operating in space. Um, and so in this case, this is called a deep worker single person submersible. Um, and there's a boom off the front here with an astronaut um, or an aquanaut, pardon me, connected at the end. And so we'll test different con ops once again under these more real um, conditions. This is an image here of a lab-based test um, that post-NEMO um, was used to actually examine some of these um, collection mechanisms as well as the idea of being tethered uh, on an, um, an astronaut, or pardon me, an asteroid. So what has been found that we have since absorbed within, the, within this science program is the following. That, um, uh, you know, to summarize really, astronauts like to be independent. Um, and so <laughs> what we found is that um, these types of modes where you have people that are actually on the end of a boom, um, while they, uh, you know, their rate is acceptable, um, let me show you what happens a little later on here, is that the crew actually ends up preferring um, you know, these types of scenarios where you have a couple people back um, in this SEV supporting a crew member at the end, whether they're untethered or tethered. Um, folks just, this seems to be the most uh, proficient and efficient way to work in terms of surveying an, astro an asteroid and then actually having somebody back within this uh, deep space um, kind, of, kind of connection point serving as a relay back to the Earth. And so they went through um, and tested these different scenarios and then came to us and said, okay, well, we want to test out this particular scenario here, but we want to do it within a real science environment. So this is where um, the Pavilion Lake Research Project comes in. So uh, PLRP is, um, as I mentioned early on, it's a project that's based in science. We have been there for 10 years. Um, we've been really lucky. We've cycled through different uh, modes of, uh, of funding um, and managed to create a long-term program. And the essence of it was to examine um, something called microbialites. Microbialites are uh, my, the, the first part of the word microbe, um, and then the second of the part word. Pardon me. Part of the word "ite" infers rock. So they're rocks that are built by microbes. And we have been examining these rocks, these microbialites, within Pavilion Lake because they are within our Earth's rock record, um, the earliest uh, and longest-lasting kind of macro uh, indications of life. So you may have heard about Shark Bay and the stromatolites there, um, and some of the old fossilized stromatolites within, let's say, the Mojave Desert or in Australia. So those are rocks that have been built up over time by microbes and show us really strong evidence that life has been around on our planet for over 2.5 billion years, 3, 3 billion years, that sort of time frame. So when we think about going to somewhere like Mars, 
Those are the types of things that we may want to look for if we're looking for past signs of life, are these rock records. So the cool thing about Pavilion Lake is that on, in a modern sense, um, microbialites have been found in very extreme environments, typically high salinity, high alkalinity. But this lake in Canada is four and a half hours eastbound of Vancouver. People live by the lake. Um, it's pH of about 8.3. People will drink in it. They'll swim. They'll water ski in it. And yet, if you put your heads on water, it's like you're going back through time, you know, um, millions, billions of years. You have very, very large microbialites there. So that was why we initially went to Pavilion Lake. But um, I've been part of this project since its inception, and I have a very um, kind of a long-standing, since I was a kid, interest in exploration, and that's why I went to, to NASA. And so we, we found that while we were there operating underwater, that this was a fantastic environment by which to offer that sort of um, testing environment to the other operational groups at NASA. And so that's how we've become part of the analog community. So this is a lot of text that I'll skip through that basically says what I've said, that we're science driven. Um, but just to give you a bit more of an overview for those who are interested in the science, this is Pavilion Lake. Um, it's, a, it's a lake that's almost six kilometers long, and it drops down at its deepest point to over 200 feet. It's not a terribly deep lake, but it's deep enough that it's challenging for us. Um, so we've moved through a bunch of different assets, as was quickly shown to you in that video, to explore the lake for the purposes of science. Um, these are the microbialites, and we're pictures of them, and they range in size from, you know, these are maybe the size of a football, all the way to um, the deeper sections of the lake where we're getting to 30 or 35 meters, um, and these are uh, nearly uh, six feet across and uh, just over six feet high. So these have been growing in this lake for almost uh, 12,000 years or so, and uh, nobody really knows why it is that this lake is supporting these structures, and that's why we've been there over time. Um, we certainly know a lot more about the chemistry and so, port, so forth that is supporting it. So we're working um, at different levels in the lake in terms of the science, and this is going to be important as we go through the talk. So this is why I wanted to show you that you know we're not only working at these kind of macro scales where we're trying to understand the different shapes and sizes of the microbialites in the lake and what they're associated with, whether it's weird chemistry in different parts of the lake, different types of topography in the lake, or what's called bathymetry. Um, or if there are different organisms that are associated with the surface of these structures themselves that are causing um, these uh, the different shapes and sizes. So some of our scientists are looking at the different layers down to you know, millimeter, submillimeter scale and trying to understand the carbonate that's being generated by these microbes and whether or not there's a, a signature of life that's being left behind and whether we can associate that with different organisms. So all of that plays back into astrobiology. But it's challenging, as I mentioned. The lake drops down to over 200 feet. It's pretty long. And when we first got there in 04, we only thought that the microbialites were in one very small section of the lake. So we started um, just kind of investigating a little bit around where we were initially working and discovered that, in fact, um, you know, although there was a paper that first came out in 2000 that described that very small swath, we discovered that there were microbialites all the way down to the 200-foot depth, which is just as the light starts to peter out. And that was important to us because we figured that the microbialites petered out further up um, around 80 to 90 feet because that's where the incoming light really started to diminish. But in fact, there are microbialites that are actively growing even at the, at the kind of deepest depths of the lake. So suddenly what that did for our science is it made it very interesting but very difficult for us to really get at the knowledge we wanted to get at just using divers or just using robots. So we managed to kind of work in three different, um, with three different assets, uh, the autonomous underwater vehicles, these deep workers, um, and then uh, scuba divers. And we've moved through different phases of the program uh, with, these, with these different assets. So the submersibles um, allowed us to put scientists, uh, 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 yes, go ahead, sorry. Oh, uh, you had intellectual resolution. Yes. What, what is oh, thanks for asking the question. So the question um, for those who are out there is, what on this slide does in real-time intellectual resolution mean? Uh, it's totally made up. Uh, but what it is is something that we were interested in examining um, in terms of the return to our science. So uh, when you look at a diver, the diver can only stay underwater at the altitude this lake is at 2,800 feet. Um, it's very cold, 4 degrees Celsius, for maybe like 20 to 40 minutes at best. Um, but they can get in real nice and close with their subject. And they are usually very highly trained in terms of the science and so forth. So their intellectual resolution in terms of their ability to think about what they're seeing and absorb it and consider maybe new hypotheses or test hypotheses in real time um, was medium to high. 
Now, when we think about getting down to depths of 200 feet, we can't actually put divers, um, you know, breathing air down at that level without putting them through decompression um, dives. And so what we decided to do is move into this deep worker phase of the program where we put the scientists into this environment here. So it's actually, in terms of the, um, the work that we were doing, which was mapping, and our ability to interact with our environment very intimately, once again, this in a real-time basis, it was sort of a medium to high rating as well. Um, the AUV, which was, uh, you know, it's a robot, you just program it and it goes out and it collects data for you in terms of imaging or side scan, sonar, or whatever you want. Uh, we were ex actually expecting it to be exactly the tool that we needed and that we didn't actually have to put people underwater. But we found it very limited in terms of what it returned. This doesn't show up very well on the screen here, but we got black and white images back of um, you know, high definition uh, black and white images, but it still didn't give us the opportunity to understand the morphology or the shapes and sizes as they pertain to different regions in the lake and get to the science we wanted to. So, this was part of our justification, part of our real thought process to really take ourselves to whether or not we should be actually you know, putting these types of assets underwater and so forth. We wanted to be um, diligent and you know, methodical about it. Let me turn the page here. The phase that we're in right now is we've gone through the initial exploration, we put our submersibles, our AUVs in the water, and now we've actually had a whole slew of papers come out examining the microbialites at different stages. Um, and we have moved in a phase, into a phase now where we're using the deep worker mapping data and honing in on different regions of the lake that we want to visit and, and collect samples from in a similar way that we did uh, when we um, first started exploring the lake, where we're actually sampling down to the millimeter or submillimeter scale. But what's cool, as I mentioned, is that the physical, as it says up here, the mental and the operational rigors that are associated with scuba diving are very, very similar to operating in space. This is why NASA actually puts all of their astronauts through a lot of rigorous underwater testing. And before you can even go out of the International Space Station to do a spacewalk, you will spend hours, you know, hundreds of hours underwater at the neutral buoyancy lab at the Johnson Space Center, um, operating and kind of fixing or doing whatever it is you have to do on that EVA, but in this underwater environment. So, what we have done previously, um, prior to the phase that, that we're in right now, in terms of looking at um, remote operations between a science team and those operating underwater, and the latency effects that we talked about um, that we have been simulating is as follows. So we've had the submersibles underwater, and we have a chase boat on the surface, so we always know where this submersible is. Um, and we also have um, information passing through a tether that includes high-definition high video, as well as the voice of the um, submersible pilot. And on board of this chase boat here, we actually have what's called an intravehicular capcom. And so what that person does is they are meant to mimic, as I showed you earlier on, the role of the astronaut sitting within that um, pressurized or free flyer um, uh, kind of vehicle. And that person is the direct connection or voice um, to this pilot who's you know, within the sub itself. And the IV Capcom role is extremely important, as it is currently during um, regular NASA missions, is that they have to have um, sort of um, a couple of roles. They have to be empath empathetic, so typically they're also an astronaut, they've also been underwater, but they also have to have the kind of intellectual knowledge of the environment that they can help this person in a very rapid fire um, way so that you know, the science that we need is retrieved. The information is then actually sent uh, by Wi-Fi back to um, this 56-foot um, trailer that's sitting on shore at Pavilion Lake. And there are a bunch of scientists. So we've had you know, 20 to 30 scientists sitting, examining the data as it comes back. But this link here is actually delayed. So we've delayed that um, during the sub-ops by 50 seconds one way. And that actually sounds like nothing, but what it did is created a whole lot of mess when we initially started testing this configuration. People were stepping on each other. Um, you know, you would wait for the response and you'd say, did you copy that? Wait, wait, did you copy that? And then you'd be responding and it was just a complete mess. So what we ended up having to do is institute a lot of different operational, um, I guess, um, kind of constraints into how we spoke to each other during these um, latencies. So we would do things like actually say, you know, um, 
30 second warning, there's going to be a transmission coming through. And then the person in the submersible would stow their you know, equipment. They would put themselves into a hover. They would put their muffin to one side. And then they could wait for that incoming bing. And then the, the conversation would start. And once that starts, then you're kind of locked into a conversation. And then when it ends, it ends. But at least there's no misunderstanding or miscommunication in terms of when something starts and stops. This, this is all common sense, and it sounds a bit ridiculous. At least, you know, we're figuring out, we're like, well, come on. But the thing is, nobody had actually ever done uh, delayed communication of this sort before. Um, underwater, under these types of circumstances that had been other tests, but not under this type of real scientific return environment where there were graduate students sitting, you know, back here that uh, required the data to come back, required certain um, information to come back to them, um, otherwise, they wouldn't graduate. So it's, it's a real you know, additional pressure, aside from the, the pressure of being underwater. Um, we also um, figured out during this first test, which was in 2011, that um, the second point here that I'm going to talk to you about um, is that depending on the operation at hand, so whether it was um, doing you know, sort of long range mapping and that communication between the subpilot and the scientists above. Um, on the surface, or if it was actually going in to sample something, we would actually hand off operational control between the IV Capcom that was on the surface or those people that were sitting on shore. And when, you, when there's something that's much more high tempo, we really had to hand off to those that were all on the lake. So everything ended up getting controlled by this group of individuals here who were in real time, non-delayed communication with each other. Once again, it sounds very common sense, but nobody had actually done that experiment in the past. And so all of this information has since been carried forward to all of the NEMO tests and other uh, simulations that have been done at JSC and are now getting incorporated into the you know, general kind of operational planning for deep space missions for humans. So where we are right now is we just got back um, in June of this year. We went back to Pavilion Lake, this time solely operating with um, uh, scuba divers and remotely operated vehicles. And so what we did here, as I mentioned, is we've gone back and actually identified regions of the lake that are of interest to us to sample at high resolution. Um, and we have a couple of questions that we're now trying to ask uh, that are still related to whether or not our communications protocols, our operational protocols, and so forth are still relevant when you go from um, dealing with people in these free flyers to now a situation where it's, um, you know, it's really make it or break it when you have people that are outside of the submersibles. When they are diving, they, we cannot move beyond the, say, you know, 20 minutes that they have underwater. That will push the limits of, um, of the dive, take them into decompression mode. Um, it's, it creates a whole lot of difficulties, the same way that it does if you're out as an astronaut on EVA and you only have nine hours. The fundamental difference for us operationally is that in the sub, if something goes wrong, you actually can be in there very happily for six hours. Um, if you have to, in emergency mode, you can be in there for 72 hours. Um, as a diver, that's it. You only have that 20 to 40 minutes, depending on the dive, and then you really have to surface um, or else all hell breaks loose. So it's, the tempo very much changed for us, um, and the kind, kind of complexity of what we were trying to do actually increased, um, despite the fact that we weren't putting these large-scale assets underwater. So the setup that we have, actually I'm going to go forward to this slide first, um, was to test this operational um, or this con up that has been uh, designed through NEMO and Desert Rat's work uh, to mimic a, a, a trip to um, an asteroid or to the moons of Mars. And so in this case, you have a science team that's sitting on the Earth, and there's a latency or delay between the science team and those that are actually out, let's say, on the asteroid. And you would have a couple of people um, sitting in this deep space station here, and they would be acting as your IV communication with the extravehicular crew and communication with the science team. So they would split duties. And then you'd actually have potentially two divers out, maybe one um, in a free flyer or both on EVA. And so they wanted us to test this configuration. And that's exactly what we did um, in that we had, once again, a chase boat with these two IV people sitting here on the boat and then two divers underwater supported by other divers. And then all of the science team was actually back on shore receiving the data. So. Um, what we ended up doing is actually going through a variety of different tests. I'll show you this video, which shows you uh, the neutral buoyancy lab that I spoke about earlier on in order to prep ourselves to get to the field this summer. So a lot of work went into actually designing the operations, um, the communication structure, and so forth. 
And then we took ourselves to the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, which is a pool which is over 60 feet deep. It has a full-scale mock-up of the International Space Station within it. Um, and we use this as a test bed for our, um, our planning. So these, this is our science team, and I'll tell you a bit about them in a moment. Um, this is, pardon me here, uh, is a, a board that was put in by the NBL crew at a 45 degree angle to mimic the lake basin. Um, and it's actually a series of old shuttle tiles, but it worked, looked, worked marvelously for our purposes. Um, as you saw in that, there, was, uh, there were six different divers that we had. All of them were trained up to operate um, under a couple of different circumstances. They were all tethered so that we could hear their voice, we could see the video coming from them, we have GoPros attached to them, as well as some of them have handheld cameras. Um, all of that data was then streamed to our remote science team, which in this case was sitting by the pool, but away from the, the folks that are operating underwater. And then we instituted a delay in this very safe environment. So we did this first before we moved out into the field. One of the, one of the things that you saw was some multiple screens of um, video that was coming in from the different divers from different angles. One of the research questions that we have um, going into this phase of our program here is which cameras provide the best view uh, and perspective depending on which task that you're interested in. So if you're interested in the science, are you most inter interested in the view that's coming back from the handheld camera or from the shoulder cam? Um, and, um, or you know, if you're interested in understanding the lay of the operations, perhaps it's the shoulder cam that's more important. One of the reasons why we're asking these questions and testing for which ones are the most valid depending on the task, and we're doing that quantitatively, is because if you ask a scientist, how many cameras do you need on a free flyer when you go to the moon or an asteroid to do your science, they will say, as many as you can give me. How much bandwidth do you need? As much as you can give me, which isn't very helpful. Um, and we've seen this at Desert Rats where we've mocked up the science, and the scientists have all sorts of cameras of various you know, degrees of definition, streaming video, taking stills, and it, what it does is just shuts down the whole system. So we wanted to look at, in this real science environment, uh, and provide learning to the ops group, what are the types of cameras that you need? And so um, uh, this is some of the work that we've been doing, as well as integrating um, this uh, robot within our lives. And so there's another question that we've been asking in terms of what is the role of a ro robotic assistant when you are conducting these types of extravehicular activities. A lot of people see a robot uh, as you know, the best way to use it as kind of like a tool caddy. Like it just kind of sits there and you put stuff on it. But we've always felt that that's sort of underutilizing the capability of a robot. And so we've been using it as different you know, camera view, as a scout, um, as well as a tool caddy and other um, different mechanisms. So. Um, let me see what time we have here. We've got a bit more time, but what do I want to talk to you about is what we did this summer. So as I mentioned, we had ROV and diver um, operations together. And in the back room, once again, we had a whole science team that was viewing the data coming back. And also, um, we were collecting metrics on which of, their, uh, which of the camera point of views were the most useful to them and when. Um, one of the cool things we had this summer is um, the involvement of um, Steve Squires. He is the principal investigator of the Mars Exploration Rovers and, and the head of the um, uh, NASA Advisory Council. And so he's been you know, running robots on Mars for a very, very long time. But if you ask the dude, you know, would you want to send another robot to Mars or would you want to go, he would say, I'll go. And you know, that was sort of validated a million times over um, when he was there with us this summer. Because you know, he, he, what we did, and I'm not showing, that's like three or four other talks, is that prior to getting to this stage where we went in fully with our divers and our science team and our robots, we actually broke things down into different engineering runs and operational runs. And he went out and drove the ROV around for us so we could test the comms all throughout the lake. And he said to me, you know, the first time he did a dive, it was just a checkout dive within Pavilion Lake. It was a total game changer. Suddenly, he moved from somebody who he, you know, he felt that he had a very cursory understanding of the microbialites and what he was looking at and what their relationship with the environment was to suddenly, was he, when he was there, you know, coming back to your question earlier on, he had this real-time intellectual resolution, which was very rich and very intimate. And so he said, you know, imagine, like, we, when, he, when he thinks about that in terms of extrapolating that knowledge, that feeling, to what he's been doing for the past decade on Mars, he just feels cheated. You know, he's like, come on, after 10 years of driving these rovers, you know, I, can, I walked around and, and made massive discoveries. So, so that's where we're at right now. Um, and it's been great to get his involvement and his point of view on this whole program. Um, 
And so one of the things that we do in terms of our capabilities is design for um, a, a mechanism so that the scientists can see the data that's coming in rapidly, synthesize it, and make it useful to them so they can make decisions, change the, the dive plans, the traverse plans of the subs, whatever it may be. Um, when we first went in with the submersibles in 2008, it was really um, like caveman style. Like we had, you know, two subs in there. We were recording the data on board of the submersible, and then all of that was actually tape. It had to be brought up to the surface and then transferred um, so that we could archive it. And uh, none of us actually got to see the data when we were in the field. And so what ensued was this: we had a couple of scientists come up from two th from 200 feet and say, holy cow, I saw, well, they swore, but anyways, they said, you know, I saw microbialites were red at 200 feet. And the other one was like, no, you didn't. They're black. And then the other one said, no, you guys are totally wrong. And it's just the lights were on. And it just went on. And it was ridiculous. You know, it was a completely ridiculous, um, banal conversation. Um, and all we had to do was actually view the tape, see where we were, so we could either go back to it or solve the color issue. So in the subsequent year, we actually went in with this uh, ground data system um, that was a piece of software that's designed at Ames and built upon the, you know, predicated upon Google Earth that allowed, it, uh, allowed us to um, synthesize the telemetry so we knew where we were, the video, the still data, um, and the notes, which is very important to a field scientist. We write and scribble every last thing into our field notebook. Suddenly, that's all here and all coupled um, and uh, synthesized in one repository. So now we could actually scroll back in time very rapidly. The science team could hear this argument between uh, divers and say, you know, I just viewed the tape. It's clearly red, and then it's solved. And that, that ridiculous conversation that went on for two hours is done. Um, and then you can say, well, it, it is red. That's very interesting. Please sample that for me um, and collect you know, the, the, the tips, the middle, and the subsurface. And that will be interesting because it will help solve my hypotheses. So, XGDS um, was in its sort of na nascency when I um, met the engineers at Ames and talked with them about some of our issues. And they said, well, hey, look, you know, we have this rover that we've been working on, this robot, and we've been designing this ground data system that's, that basically at that time kind of synthesized the um, telemetry and uh, some of the other kind of engineering um, components into this software. And so they said, we really want a real science um, question to work on. So they started designing X this XGDS system. I think there's actually a talk online by Matt Deans that explains this in more detail. But what has happened is this, this XGDS program has since been absorbed by NEMO, by Desert Rats, and now is being used by something called the Mojave Volatiles, Volatiles Prospector, which is a precursor robotic mission we just did in the Mojave Desert to a mission that hopefully will fly in the next five years to the moon, uh, which is called Resource Prospector. And that mission is to go to the far side of the moon and look for water. But it's got a very short time frame. It's not like what's happened on Mars. It's only going to operate for 10 to 14 days. It's got to look for water. It's going to be deking in and out of um, permanently shadowed regions. Um, and so that, that's operationally, the tempo is much more akin to what we've been dealing with at Pavilion Lake. And, and X, these, this XGDS system has since been sort of grown into that environment, too. So it's one of the, the really great capabilities that has been designed um, at Ames um, and that you know, we've, we've had a lot of, of interesting development success with. Um, this summer, we had you know, a new challenge for the, the engineers, and that was that they had to design a system which was even faster than what they had designed um, in terms of our decision-making capabilities for the subs. This is because now, as I mentioned, we had divers. And the divers were only underwater for 20 to 40 minutes. We were also, every time the divers came up, they had loads of samples. We had grad students, this is Mark Belan, he's actually from Canada, and they were examining um, the microbialites as they came up, another um, scientist from New Zealand, and actually looking at the surface structure, um, looking at the microbes that were there, and then feeding that data back into XGDS. And we had to react to that as well as we planned the dives and even within the dives themselves. So there was a new kind of higher level of, um, or a, high, a faster pace, really, to the whole operation. Um, every evening, we would have discussions that went on and, and on, and um, heated discussions between scientists and engineers, scientists and scientists, almost broke out into fist fights, but were, were, were very, very productive. Um, and we also, yeah, I know, yeah, nobody got killed, so that's always good. Um, no paperwork. Um, so we also went back to, as I showed you earlier on, some of these acceptability assessments. And we're just compiling this right now. And we should, we're hoping to put a, a draft together by the end of this year for publication. But 
Um, what we were looking at, once again, is um, acceptability ratings in terms of the simulation that we, we um, conducted, as well as um, some of the capabilities and how well they were, in, they were um, uh, rated in terms of their success in supporting our mission. So some of the things that we found, this is kind of high level learning at this point in time, um, is that it was a vi we, we found by consensus that as I showed you in that earlier diagram where we're looking at the con ops where you have two people as IVs supporting the people, at, two other people out on I, um, EVA, it, there has been a lot of discussion as to whether or not you really need two IVs or um, supporting that or just one. That, that makes a huge difference to NASA in terms of training, um, how much effort you got to put in, you got to pay you know, two extra people and all that sort of thing, and two extra crew going out that far. We found that we could not have done anything under that kind of tempo, that kind of difficulty without those two IV. One focused actually solely on the science, um, talking to the science team in delay mode, talking to the, um, the other IV about the science and making suggestions to the dive team. And then the other IV was completely focused on their, um, their safety essentially, telling them where they were within the dive plan, how much um, time they had left based on the, um, the, the uh, pressure that they were, the divers were reading back to us you know, as it decreased over time. And that subdivision was very, very important to us um, and rated as extremely important throughout the entire program. We also started to examine the camera and imagery capabilities as I talked to you about and looked specifically at the shoulder cam, the ROV view, as well as the um, the, the handheld camera um, that was uh, used by one of the divers. Now, the way that that diver used that handheld camera is that he would, as we found a sample we wanted, or a microbialite we wanted to sample, he would scooch in very gently and use the camera to actually image that structure in high definition video. And that was streaming back to us and we were then feeding forward decisions as to whether or not to sample there or move on. Um, and then there was the shoulder cam, which gave us a view over their shoulder as to where their hands were and what was going on around them. And then we had the ROV, which was giving you a different point of view, kind of the lay of the land, the contextual shot. And what we found is that um, the, uh, the, the camera that was handheld was most important to the scientists, because that allowed us to say, hey, go in tighter. Let's see if that is that, that little nodule that's a centimeter a lot, you know, in, in, in width is actually red or if it's green, that, that helps us with our, test our different hypotheses. But what we did find, um, which was brand new to any of these analogs, is that we don't actually need a scientist's high definition video. You can collect that on site, but all we needed was a high definition still. But what that means is that if you're gonna shoot back a still of something, that it means a couple things. First of all, the scientist or the diver that's un underwater or the astronaut that's uh, on EVA has to have quite a substantial amount of scientific training under their belt to know when to press the button to send you a still. Otherwise, he or she could be just sending you garbage. Um, and so we had the benefit of having one of the, really was considered one of the best um, cold water divers in the world who's also an astrobiologist in that role. So he knew exactly when to say, this looks good or this doesn't look good. Um, but if you didn't have that and it was, say, somebody that didn't come from a science background, that may have been very different. So these are all, there are nuances to the things that we learned that we've been capturing over time. Um, these are kind of prompts to me um, to talk to you about some of the other learning. Um, but one of the other things we did, a lot of the learning that I, I just showed you was done under the 50 second one way um, delay. Something that had never been done before prior to June um, was actually um, testing in these circumstances in a five minute delay mode, five minute one way. This changes the operation substantially because five minute one way means 10 minute return and that doesn't even account for the kind of thinking time that the science team might need to make a decision on whether to sample, to move on, or to come up, and so forth. And so um, what we did is we designed um, this circuit sampling strategy that essentially meant that the people on EVA, the divers underwater, were never without something to do. And we joke about the fact that we should probably institute this at work as well, where there's always a task that you have to be doing um, so to, to be as efficient as possible in the time you've got. And so these guys only had 20 minutes underwater. We've got a five minute delay. You can do the math. That just makes it a really difficult situation. But they had to select samples that the grad students could use to graduate. And they had to do it, um, uh, but still give us the option. So what we did is allowed them to we pre-selected a circuit based on the ROV data um, and uh, deep worker data that had already been garnered. And then actually 
allowed them to go through and drop basically, uh, you know, like breadcrumbs. Here's a good one, here's a good one, and then image it really tight. And all that information was coming back to the science team. And as they were waiting, they would kind of, you know, they would progress along in um, a bit of a circuit, like a circle. And then as they were waiting for us to make our decision, and they were able to time that underwater too, they were tasked with other scientific um, data that we wanted to get, such as water samples or um, collection of rocks and so forth. So we made sure that every single task was understood in terms of the amount of time it would take and ensured that by the time a de decision came back to them, they were ready and prepped and, and um, able to go. And that you know, every task that we needed them to get done was done um, without them having to, to wait around. What the scientists did in order to expedite the, the decision-making process under this time delay was this. They knew that they were going to have four or five different options. Um, and there was a leaderboard. So as soon as they saw uh, the first option, they would sort of take a guess as to whether or not that was going to get prioritized as one or maybe as four. And they would kind of throw that up on a leaderboard, that, and those numbers and those projections were getting sent forward to the boat and then communicated down to the divers. And that would get updated. So, you know, for example, if they saw A, they would say, well, I think it's going to be number four. And then if they came to the next sample, B, they would say, oh, no, you know, A is better than B. And that leaderboard kept getting rapidly updated, and that information communicated down to the divers. What that did was it prompted the divers to already know where they might be going to do the collections. Now, I don't know if any of you are divers in the room. Are there, actually, are, are any of you divers in the room? OK, cool. So you know diving is actually not easy. Um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot coming at you. Um, and in this circumstance, they're fully suited in uh, dry suits. And they are at four degrees, you know, they're in four degrees Celsius weather, or pardon me, water. And they're also wearing full face masks, which are highly uncomfortable. Thank you. Um, and so there is a lot coming at them. And so for them to be able to prepare themselves for something is highly useful um, in terms of making sure that they're managing through everything that they're dealing with, including their air. I only have five minutes left, but some of the other learning that we came out with is that actually very clear marking of any samples is extremely important. In the past, what's been used in other tests is just kind of dropping you know, um, little weights with um, string coming off them without any clear markings on them. This is actually not what can, you know, we can't actually um, do anything with that if you're dealing with these five minute delays and these kind of leaderboard circumstances. So. Um, these, these types of, of learnings is something we're putting together in a paper and that, as I mentioned, will be pushed forward to the other um, test environments. So just some kind of summary statements about these Pavilion Lake and other types of tests like this is that these non-simulated science activities, they act as um, an honest forcing function for us to drive out the operational, the technical, and the mission components that enable and enhance hypothesis testing and ultimately scientific dis discoveries. Um, we want to go out, we want to test, and we want to refine all of these operational and, cap and cap um, uh, concepts and capabilities, and then test again. Now, some of the issues we have is that right now, Pavilion is really n equals 1. There's only really that as it stands in the community, and we need to have more of these, and that's what we're working on right now. Um, we have an opportunity because scientists at NASA do go out into the field a lot, and so this summer, we're headed back, um, and what we're doing is going to make our lives more difficult but it's still an interesting task. We're going to take some of our science team and have them sit at home and see what that does to us. Um, and so we're not exactly sure how to enable ourselves to communicate and stay uh, motivated as a team in this circumstance. Um, because when you're in the field and it's very intense, uh, it changes the dynamic, the working dynamic. Um, you, know, as, you know, if you're working on a project and you're all working together over long hours, it sort of, you kind of gel. And so if you have people sitting far away, but they still have to be part of that intensity, how are we going to deal with that? And this distributed science background team scenario is going to happen when we have deep space missions. You can't have everybody move to, you know, um, let's say, Houston or whatever. You're going to have to stay at home with your families. Um, but still be really locked into these high tempo missions. Um, another program which we're just starting up, which is called Finesse, uh, as Chris mentioned earlier, is actually a land-based program where we are using robots and humans um, out in two different environments. One is in the East, uh, East uh, Snake River Plain in Idaho, which is an old volcanic field, as well as an impact crater in uh, northern Quebec called the West, West uh, Clearwater Impact Cr Crater. And so we're using those two environments as um, scientific learning environments, again, and hoping to tack on a lot of the exploration learning that we've been doing at Pavilion Lake. So thank you very much um, to 
all of you for coming out and for those who are uh, attending the talk virtually. I really appreciate it. And I am ready to take any questions you may have. And the AV work, thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. How much, ex OK, so the question is, do I have any metrics on how much extra lag um, decreases the efficiency of the work? So like, if we increase the latency, how does it decrease the efficiency? That's a great question. So we have two years worth of testing, so n equals 2, hooray. Um, and what we found is that actually this, the, um, the science that we've managed to return has not diminished in its productivity nor in its output. Um, but there have got to be nuances in there, for sure, that we're not capturing. Um, but in terms of the metric that we capture, which is science return, have we tested our hypothesis? Yes. Have we published the paper? Yes. It's actually one for one. So there has been no change between whether we're using the submersibles, the divers under 50 second delay, or if we change it to a five minute one way delay. Um, we're still getting the data return that we need. Um, but what has fundamentally changed are the, um, the kind of support tools that we need and the camera views. And, and once again, coming back to the XGDS system and how rapidly we're able to, to um, extract the information we want from that and use that to make decisions. There have been some, some big learning that's come in that we're trying to institute this year to change uh, and update that system so that it can support these, um, I guess, uh, like higher tempo kind of um, scenarios as well as the scenarios where you have these longer latencies instituted. Yeah. No, no, that's a great question. We have not. We meant to do that this year. Um, but it got very complicated very fast. And so we ended up focusing just simply on the different uh, camera angles. But next year, we hope to do that. And we hope to be able to dial up and down the different camera views um, and actually do that first um, you know, going in, I guess, with a kind of a, a test platform where we actually know at this moment we're going to be dialing back this and that. But then after that, start to react to what the scientists are requiring. So if we see them and they're only, you know, the science Capcom is saying, actually, at this point, we only need to view um, the handheld camera, then we'll dial everything else back and amp up that uh, bandwidth. But yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, and once again, that's a completely outstanding question for us because any scientist will say, give me it all. You know, give me all she's got. <laughs> Thank you.